morning, everybody. Welcome to Grace Fellowship Church. It is good to see you. Yeah, as it should be. We are happy that you're here. As you find your seats, I'm going to go ahead and invite you to stand and uh, let's worship the Lord together. Uh, and, uh, you know, let's just focus on him for a second and um, give him the best of what we got this morning. Who 
never fails will not fail me now you won't fail me now in the waiting the same god who's never late is working all things out you're working on so we say together yes and yes i will lift you high in the lowest valley yes i will bless your name the name of all names nothing can stand against and I choose to praise to glorify glorify the name of all names nothing can stand against yes I will lift you high in the lowest valley yes I will bless your name Yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Yes, I will for all my days. Yes, I will for all my days. Yes, I will. Let's say a word of prayer. If you can just bow with me for a second. Father God, we we do say yes. We choose to say yes. Even in our dark days and our dark times, Father God, we have a hope that you are there for us, that you have the best intention for us. And you have our lives in the center of your hands. And you are capable, capable hands. We trust you, Father God, and I pray, Lord, that you direct our lives. Help us to take that next step forward, especially when our life is underneath, when our life is down. Bring us uh, bring us safety, comfort. Bring us your healing touch, your healing hand, and guide us out. We thank you, Lord, for who you are, and we praise you, and we say yes. All together, we say yes, right? Amen. Amen. Yes, yes. fellow neighbors here for a minute or so. Well, welcome, everyone. I hate to interrupt this wonderful time of visiting, but my name is Sheila, and I have the privilege of giving announcements this morning. And uh, just to start out, if you are near, new here, we welcome you if you've been here for months, years, whatever, we welcome you here today. If you haven't filled out a Connect card, we would love to be connected with you. In the back of the chairs, you'll find a white card, and if you can bring that to the Welcome Center at the back after, there's a gift awaiting you, and we'd just like to get to know you. So, um, And then February 11th, we've got Prime Timers coming up. It was Singing in the Rain. I wish I would have... Yes! I thought we all could sing a song together real quick here. Jerry, you want to lead it? Do, 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 do. Okay. Maybe we won't do that today. But anyway, sign up in the lobby after church today for that. Uh, next Sunday, February 5th at the 9 a.m. hour is our annual meeting. So last week you should have received a packet. If you did not, I believe we probably have some out in the lobby today to pick up. And if you could do that, and um, it will be in the 9 a.m. hour. And then Thursday, February 2nd at 7 p.m. If you have questions about the church finances, this is the time to get those answered. There will be a meeting in the library for that. Okay, so two different, we've got our February 5th, 9 a.m. hour, and then there's a finance Q&A. So two separate things I'm speaking of here, and that one is February 2nd, 7 p.m. And then we have a women's Bible study starting on February 21st, and Martha's going to come speak on that. Good morning. It's good to see all of your faces this morning. We are excited uh, for this next month, February 21st. Debbie King will be teaching us through Psalm 119. Psalm 119, 
And um, we are just so looking forward to hearing from her and all that she has to share and just teaching us in God's word. It's going to be a blessing. That will be starting on the 21st, Barrett Hall at 10 a.m. And uh, we would love to have you join us. There is a sign-up sheet in the lobby, and um, there's a, no limit to how many ladies can come. So please join us. And, and um, we have covers already out there for your binder. So we're getting ready, and we're excited. The other thing we want to let you know about is coming up in April, we, there is a women's retreat that we will be attending down at Redwood Christian Park, which is in the Santa Cruz Mountains. And the retreat is called Renew. And uh, there's information about that retreat out on the counter in the lobby as well. But uh, if you're able to join us, we'd love to have you. And we can tell you more about that. Um, but grab a, a flyer, brochure, and you can read a little more. And then you register online. So um, I did hear that the nicer rooms are filling up already. So um, for the camp, but it's in April, April 21st through the 23rd. And so we'd love to have you join us for that as well. Thank you so much. Have a blessed Sunday. I assume these chairs were here for me. That was nice. Thank you. And the, if you haven't been to that women's retreat at RCP, that is such a great time. I know we've gone numerous years, and it's just wonderful. So it'd be great to have as many of us there that could come from our church. And on the church center, I'm not sure how you all are doing with downloading that on your phone. If you have any questions, there's... I would love to help. There's a lot of people here that would love to help you download that and get your information. It was really easy. This last week I went on and updated our information and just kind of, there's just a few little clicks. But if you need help at all with that, please ask. And then there's a trifold out in the lobby that has information on doing that also. And if you get a chance to upload a picture of your family or yourself, or go ahead and do that also. Um, this will be like our church calendars on there. Also, this is what our director is moving to. So we have that church directory app, but this is what, if you're looking for someone's address, birthday, this is where you would find it. So if you haven't signed up for that, please uh, do so. And again, if you need help, there's a lot of us here that would love to help you with that. And lastly, we have free offering here at Grace. There's three ways to give. We have the box in the back. You can mail in, or there's the Vanco app that you can go on. And thank you just for continuing to give and support all the ministries here we have at the church and keep things running as they do. So I'll just pray for our morning here. Oh Lord, we just pause and just welcome you here. Thank you for being present with us. Um, Father, would our hearts just be open to um, everything you have for each of us today. And we just thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Sheila. I welcome you here this morning. Uh, my name is Mark. If you're visiting today, I am the lead pastor here at Grace, and in a moment, I'll be able to uh, share the Word of God with you. But before that, I wanted to point out, as a part of our annual meeting we're going to have next Sunday, uh, for those of us who are members of Grace, we ask you to vote on a couple of things. Uh, one is to, to see our spending plan for 2023 uh, and, and to vote to affirm that, as well as our how we structure ourselves in leadership is uh, we have a board of elders that meet together. Uh, they're representative of us as a congregation. Uh, we also have a, a board of deacons that represent all of the leadership, uh, individual ministries. And because that board of elders is kind of the, our, our, that's who I answer to as a lead pastor and so on, is our executive leadership team, um, we want to make sure that you have a say, that you have a vote to affirm the elder board's recommendation. And so this year we are recommending uh, Jerry Brady at, to come on our elder board beginning in 2023 this, this year. And each of our elders, they serve for four years at a time. And uh, so I'm going to invite Jerry to come on up here and join me on stage. Now, Jerry and Sue have been a part of our fellowship here at Grace since 2010. And uh, they formerly did, lived in the Bay Area. It's solid. It won't give out. It's real good. Uh, and uh, they came to join us. They moved into the area and, um, and found Grace as their church home. And they immediately got involved, Jerry and Sue did. And we we're so grateful that you did. I uh, started out uh, introducing a ministry that we hadn't heard of yet called Stephen Ministry. And uh, that was, uh, we, we've trained 
dozens of people in our congregation uh, to be trained listeners, for lack of a better term, for people who are going through a difficult time. And how uh, part of our church community, it's so vital that we have um, a base of empathy toward one another when we walk with one another through hard things. And Stephen ministry really was an important part of that. And um, uh, Jerry and Sue uh, were key in making that ministry happen. And then Jerry served on our board of deacons. Uh, he became the chairman of the board of deacons. And his term, that's also a four-year term that ended for him. And he now you can't be, keep a good man down. He, was, he started uh, working with our men's ministry. So now he's the director of our men's ministry and so on. And so he seemed a very um, um, uh, easy qualification or easy recommendation for us as a board of elders when we're thinking about people who um, have a heart for grace, have a heart for people here in our local fellowship. Um, who will assist us, work together with us in our leadership team at the Board of Elders. So Jerry came to mind uh, many times uh, in that regard, and this year we're recommending him for that position. He has said yes. And so you have a bit of that information in your annual report, um, but I want to ask Jerry a few questions this morning to get so you get to a chance to get to know him a little bit better. And uh, and so, you know, a little bit of your history, Jerry. I mean, how... Tell us a little about your faith history. How did you come to faith in Jesus? Um, I always knew that there was a God and a Jesus. I wasn't raised in a Christian home, but come to find out both my mom and dad were believers. They just didn't share it. Um, but in my mid-20s, my mother-in-law remarried after being widowed, and the gentleman that she married um, was an on-fire Christian and talked and talked and talked and then I had uh, to me about Jesus and um, and I also had a salesman that called on me that witnessed to me several times at lunch and I attended a couple of Billy Graham crusades and at age 25 I went to bed one night as Dale would say pillowed my head and uh, thought you know what Jesus I think I need you I want you please come into my heart and I accepted Jesus that night, and it's been great since. Um, slow learner, but uh, it's it's a wonderful experience. Yeah, I'm so grateful. You know, your life um, after faith in Jesus was just perfect after that, right? Or <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> far from. Yeah, I mean. You experienced just the, just the same things we all have, and even um, the death of a spouse, and um, and God bringing in you know Sue into your life. She had experienced the death of her spouse, and God brought you guys. How, what's the story of how you guys got to know each other and, and meet each other? I, I didn't tell him I was going to ask this, but I, <laughs> you know, you just uh, well, not not the how you get to meet each other, but it's like you know, tell us about Sue. You guys are kind of a package deal. I mean, we get you, but. You know, we're the two become one flesh, right? So we're like you're one family here. Yeah. Talk about your relationship with Sue and I'm very proud of Sue. Sue, uh, with Stephen Ministry, just a little blip, trained 99 people in the I think eight, eight years, years that she did. did. I, 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 I served five, five years, years and finally had to go back out. But um, actually, we leave today in our trailer for four days in Monterey to celebrate our 25th first day, the first date. <laughs> Yeah. Well, we'll celebrate our anniversary later, but um, um, we we lived in San Jose. We thought we might want to, we had a home in Denver, second home in Denver that we didn't use and sold, and we thought, well, why can, we came through uh, Amador County one Sunday, and I said, well, let's buy five acres and put our trailer on it and just have a getaway. That didn't work at all, so we started looking for a house. We bought a house actually in 2008 and would come and visit for a weekend or a week, whatever worked out. And we finally decided that it was time to find a local church. So when the Sundays that we were here, we would have a place to go. A fellow working for us at the house so recommended grace he was attending at that time we uh, came enjoyed the, the the worship enjoyed the um, teaching the friendship the friendly people um, it just felt really good I had told Sue 
actually that Sunday driving here, and I want to make sure we visit all the churches before we make a decision. And after that couple of Sundays, we decided this was going to be our church home, and I'd never step foot in another church in this county. <laughs> but um, it's been wonderful. Well, we're, we're, we, we moved here full-time in February of 10. Well, we're grateful that you did feel welcome and found us as a church family. We have benefited greatly because you guys are here. Thank you. So, so have we. Yeah, that's the way it works, right? right. Yeah. Um, so all this time, you guys have been a part of Grace Fellowship and, um, and being involved in ministry and so on. And as the elders have been praying about you know, who to add to our elder team this year, uh, we were praying about your name, and I and I had, uh, you know, we agreed, you know, we want to offer that recommendation. Um, so, in your praying about this, since you know being asked and um, feeling good about moving forward to put your name out there to us as a congregation, uh, as the elder board's recommendation for the elders, how how has God kind of moved in your own heart in that process of of saying yes to our recommendation of you as a as a potential elder? It was a very interesting when you uh, offered the opportunity. I had thought about 10, 12 months prior, I had a thought come through me, my mind that I, would, I think I would like to be an elder. I wish I had the qualifications. I wish I was capable of being an elder. I don't have the teaching skills. I'm not comfortable up here, and here I am. But um, it, um, it just it was... It's sad in my heart that I didn't feel I had the qualifications. When Mark um, approached me, he shared that he thought I did have some necessary qualifications um, other than um, teaching and preaching and being up here. But um, um, I have some leadership skills. I have a great love for all of you. I love working with the men. Um, I just would love to be a part of the leadership and help this church continue to be vibrant and grow and be a healthy church. Do what I can. Yeah, and we feel the same way. You know, uh, our elder board serves in the, in the function of a shepherd. Um, to lead the congregation to shepherd um, individuals toward maturity. And the reason that you came to mind so much in our conversation is that, you know, particularly as I reflected upon um, your life, your impact, um, you know, if you've been around Grace for any length of time, even though you don't spend a lot of time on the stage, there's not a lot of people who don't know Jerry Brady. Um, he invests in people's lives, he and Sue, and um, he, you, you make so many um, efforts to connect with men uh, on a one-to-one. -one. You're, you're very much aware of needs in, in the fellowship, individual needs, families' needs, and, and you guys really work hard at seeing, okay, what is our part in helping with that need, whatever that looks like? And that heart uh, of shepherding people is the quality um, that we want every one of our elders to possess. And that's what we see in you primarily that has really made um, our recommendation of you, um, you know, a no-brainer for us. So thank you. Well, next Sunday, you'll have an opportunity to also uh, vote your approval or your concern um, about Jerry serving on our board of elders. And I would encourage you between now and then, if you don't know Jerry, um, to introduce yourself to him and ask him any questions you want to get to know him better and, and so on. Uh, and you'll, I think your confidence will be raised in, uh, in the elders' recommendation of him. Thank, Thank you very much, Jerry. saying yes. And you might be new to this church and uh, new to, you know, these kinds of ideas. And you're thinking, well, say yes to what? What are we talking about here? And uh, the big giant yes that is available to all of us is to follow Christ and where he leads. And uh, where he leads, we choose to follow because that is our best 
It's our best life. It's not not easy. Sometimes it's kind of kind of hard, but it is our best hope for existing. This song, and Jerry's just a guy that said yes. This next song is uh, entitled Take My Life and Just Let It Be. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to me. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my lines and let them move at the impulse of thy love. Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for thee. Swift and beautiful for thee. Take my voice and let Always only for the key. Take my lips and let them be filled with messages from thee. Filled with messages from thee. Take my love and Lord I pour at thy feet its treasure. Take myself and I will be ever only all for thee, ever only all for thee. And everybody said, Amen. Thank you, church. Go ahead and stand for the reading of the word. We're in Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Please be seated. Thank you, Steve. So today we are concluding a four-part series. If you've been here the last few weeks, you have seen that we've been teaching through, as we do many of our Januaries, uh, just re remind ourselves of reestablishing um, the four words that kind of guide us in our, our calling, our ministry, our mission at Grace Fellowship, and why we exist and how we go about um, preaching the gospel and, and growing the community of faith and so on. It's centered around these four words, come, grow, serve, go. And just as a reminder, what each of these mean... Um, hold on, my... Have you switched over to my computer? Not yet. Okay. Just leave it then for what it is. Come, grow, serve, go. Come, we gather on a Sunday morning in our community of faith. And uh, it's our worship service. That we, this is our touch point every single week. In addition to other smaller touch points, uh, that we gather to praise God's name, to hear the word of God, to see one another and collectively worship together. The second one is to grow in uh, emotional and spiritual maturity. How we, are, this is that once we place our faith in Jesus, we spend the rest of our life growing in who God has created us to be and how we benefit from one another in that community of faith. Thirdly, what we talked about last Sunday was serving. Um, we're part of a church household. And like any 
functioning, highly functioning household, every person, every individual of that house has a purpose. They have a way that we contribute to the building up of one another. And we do that in various ways. And we talked about last week of, of pouring out our lives to serve so that others would benefit in the body of Christ. And today is our last Sunday where we talk about go, that we demonstrate the love of God in vitality. That is the, our catchphrase that, that we are trying to establish a movement of God's people so transformed that the light of the gospel goes out from this place. As we leave these doors, our lives begin to an- impact other lives around us. Um, we are transformed as individuals. We transform our household, our families as a result. Our families transform our community. Our community transforms our state, so on, until the world is transformed. A light goes out. And wherever we go, that's where God goes because he is dwelling in us in vitality. And that's, that's our hope uh, as a church fellowship. And one of the ways we do that is, you know, when you reach out, you know, you start, here we are in my individual life and in our, in our community life, we reach all the way out to different parts of the world through our missions uh, program. I don't know if you know this, if you're visiting, uh, 10% of all of the income that comes in, you're giving, um, goes right back out to support worldwide missions, both missions uh, across the globe as well as uh, other missions here locally. One of those missions... Uh, is our connection with Haiti. In 2010, there was a, you remember, uh, an earthquake in Haiti that really sparked our interest in the needs of those who were living there, who were kind of picking up their, the pieces of their lives in so many ways in that state. We, we established some relationships uh, there, and one of which uh, was born in the heart of Wendy Chadwick, um, the idea of connecting, building a bridge between here and Haiti to, to connect with students, children, uh, to give them an education, the gospel of Jesus Christ enabled them to invest in their community, just like we're trying to invest in our community. And we call that program The Bridge, and it's a sponsorship program where many of you are sponsoring children um, in that school, to, having received an education and, and growing up in Jesus Christ, um, to, and have a hot meal uh, every single day. And we're grateful for your investment. Now, this morning, to kind of report on that, uh, give us an update, is Claudel, who is with us, uh, and Jeremy. And so Jeremy is going to come up, and he's going to share a little bit about what's happening with the bridge. Thank you, Jeremy. This fine young man here, I just want to say it was, it was really interesting, the verses that were just read for today. And, you know, a couple weeks ago, we sent our oldest son off to Thailand, and many of you, we prayed over him and that. He was asked kind of last minute to share at their church service this morning, because, you know, they're like, what, 15 hours ahead of us. And so those were the verses he chose to speak on this morning in Thailand. So I thought that's kind of cool how God does that. But as as Pastor Mark mentioned, um, many of you have been uh, helping support the Bridge Program for a number of years now. And um, Claudel here, uh, he's my brother. Can you tell? He is my brother in the Lord. But Claudel um, came out because on Friday we all attended a service, a uh, memorial service and celebration of life for Debbie Schnabel. And Debbie uh, was instrumental in helping start the bridge program with Wendy back when it was uh, placed on Wendy's heart to do this. And what's so cool is Claudel was kind of the boots on the ground in Haiti that we were connected with to work with for the school. And you were, he was kind of a teacher there, and, and, and he helps us in communication back and forth. And to this day, he continues uh, to be so instrumental in helping us. We don't speak Haitian Creole, but Claudel's pretty good at it. Yes, yeah. <laughs> so it's really helpful to have a translator that can communicate with the school administrators there and back to Wendy, and, and we can have that open communication, and he helps keep tab on that. And so Anyway, I'm just going to ask Claudel a couple questions this morning, and so you can kind of get to know him and then see what's kind of going on. So, Claudel, um, some of us that were back here in 2015 may have seen you come and, and share with us then, but it's, it's, you've not been here since then. So I wonder if you could tell everybody kind of what's been happening in your life since then. Okay, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm so happy to be here. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here again. That's... A, a great place to be with the with the children of the Lord. So 
since I've been here in 2015, uh, so many things changed in my life. Uh, I, w I was immigrated to the U.S., uh, especially in Florida. I got married with a beautiful young lady. So we got our kids together. And, um, and now, I mean, last week, I became a U.S. citizen. So it's still... <laughs> Thank you. And um, also, we work with kids in, in, uh, in Florida, especially in Fort Pierce, and um, helping the kids and, you know, teach them. And uh, we got a couple of people who work there with a uh, little business. Uh, the name is uh, No Elite Academy. So, so many people, I mean, five people working there in, uh, during the day. And uh, in the afternoon, we got another five people that help us, you know, working with the kids, take kids, uh, to school and pick them up from school to uh, the center. So that is my life in Florida. So I think it's wonderful. Claudel has such a heart for children that you know he was so impactful in the school in Carpopo because he loved the children, working with the children, and such a heart for the Lord that he comes to the United States and starts a, a big daycare program because he just loves being around children so much and can instill is impacting children here in the U.S. I just think that's wonderful. So, Claudel, can you kind of give us an update on kind of what has been happening at the school currently, how things are going there? Yes. And also, I would like to take this time to say a big thank you for all of you who support the program. And uh, it's a privilege to know that uh, you guys put aside and help to help uh, the kids in Kafupwa. But the last few years was very, have been very difficult for us in Kafu, in, in Haiti, especially in our Port au area. So, so many unrest and kidnapping, uh, uh, manifestations, and so inflation, so many crazy things happening right now. And um, the school that's supposed to open on uh, September, so that we couldn't open, and uh, we just opened uh, this month and uh, kids trying to come to school. And still today now, we got a um, outbreak of cholera in, uh, in Haiti, port au prince area. So many people dying because we don't have uh, clean water. You know, we drink uh, you know, water from you know, the canal, uh, from the river, which is unclean because, because people, you know, do, uh, you know, take a shower on the, on the river and, and, and people take the, the same water to drink, the same water to cook, so, so many things happening right now in, in, uh, in Haiti. So, Canel, I know that there's a, a new program that's kind of coming up here pretty soon um, that's going to really impact the school and that. Can you want to just briefly talk about that? Yes. So, we have uh, a new program that's coming in. You know, bridge help in so many ways. You know, it's a big deal for us to get to know that the kids have the privilege to go to school and they don't have to pay anything because of you. And also they got the privilege to get a hot meal. It's, having a hot meal where I come from is a big deal. Why is it a big deal? Because sometimes, most of the time we spend days without having you know, to eat. And if we eat, this, I mean, if we got a chance to eat in the morning, we don't know if we're gonna eat in the, for, for lunch, we don't know what we're gonna eat for dinner. So it's a big deal. It's a, when you donate extra money for meals that help a lot a lot a lot people get to eat at the school even the teachers got to eat at the school that's that's really good but the most important is to you know the kids have to know jesus got to hear that to get to know about you know our savior that's really important now we got a new program coming in because uh, the teachers in Haiti they don't have to have a specific certification to you know to teach so that's kind of very difficult for the teachers to, you know, for the kids, especially to, uh, you know, those kids that don't have, you know, you know, we all different. Some people learn easier than the others. So some people, you know, learn quick. For, but in my in Haiti, for kids that doesn't have ability to learn quick, so they left behind. They left behind. So we have a new program which really interesting that's gonna help the kids, help the teachers, you know. We, you know, teach them how to teach the kids better and how to, you know, teach those that doesn't have, you know, learning, learning, learning easily, quicker. So that's this program going to help 
with all the kids, even though it's uh, expensive, but for us, it's very important. It's very extremely, extremely important to have this program to teach the teachers to, uh, you know, give them tools so they can do their job better. That's a very interesting program. So yeah, if you could be praying about that, it's, it, it is a, a really going to have a great impact on the school to get these teachers this kind of training. And we'll hear more about that at the missions month coming up uh, in, in March, and we'll give you an update on how that's going. But um, Claire, I just want to take a moment and just pray, okay? Great. Heavenly Father, um, I just love the fact that you have put in the heart of this church, Lord, to be a people that desires, Lord, to reach out to the world around us with the good news of Jesus Christ. And Lord, it is a, such a, a privilege and honor to be able to work um, with others around the world, Lord, who have a similar heart to share the gospel and to pour into other people's lives your love and the change that you can make in their hearts. And, and I, I just thank you for Claudel and his passion for children, his desire, Lord, to be a light to such young, impressionable minds in uh, sharing your love with them. And so I just pray your continued blessing upon him and the work he's doing at home, but also, Lord, um, this is continued work and efforts in the communication between our church and the village and the school there in Carfuqua, uh, where you are doing such amazing things, Lord. Um, we just thank you, God, for loving us so much, and that, God, you give us the privilege to work alongside you, God, um, to, to do this great work. And so uh, we thank you, and I just uh, pray your blessing on Claudel and his family, and we just pray this in the power of Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, Claudel. And that just represents one of so many ways that Grace Fellowship impacts people around the world with the good news of Jesus Christ. And that is our, our desire to fulfill the Great Commission. Uh, the verses we read this morning, go and, and make disciples of all nations, um, has been the mandate of the church since the beginning. And it's interesting to note that in the Old Testament, how God made himself manifest uh, was through Israel, uh, the city on the hill, the light on the light stand, where they were in one place in a country that was small and they didn't have a lot of a military might, and yet God blessed them so much that it could be, having, it could be famines all around them, but there in their land, the plants would be growing. There would have crops. There could be nations that were far greater than them that would surround them, but God would deliver them. So they were this uh, central place where people, you know, no matter what you do, this this little under uh, 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 under militarized, uh, you know, don't have a lot of money type of uh, of of country can be so blessed that the nations around them would say, what is it about them? Who is their God that they have been protected in such a way? That was the, the way of evangelism, letting the gospel be known in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, when, when, uh, when God was manifest in the temple, now the temple is you and me. When we place our faith in Jesus Christ, God comes to dwell in us. And now instead of the temple dwelling in Jerusalem and people coming to Jerusalem, now the temple, God's spirit goes out in among the nations. And we go out from here and we spread the light because the light is in us. And that's the great privilege we have in sharing the gospel all around the world. So this morning, as we focus on that, uh, I want to uh, give you three, if you have a, in your bulletin, there's a blank piece of paper there. If you want to take notes, there's going to be three points of the message this morning um, with regard to the gospel. We've already gone through our overview here. So the one, number one is the proclamation of the gospel. Second point we're going to make is the demonstration of the gospel and transforms lives. You and I are our lives being changed because of the gospel. And then the invitation of the gospel. The first being the proclamation of the gospel. You know, what is the gospel essentially? And, and the gospel is so much more than this, but it begins at least with the idea of salvation. How does one come to have a relationship with God? That is the heart of the gospel, where many of us are introduced 
to this idea of this good news. We're introduced to a person of God and his son, Jesus Christ. And there's some pillars to this thought process. Number one, we have to understand that there is a God and he's good. There is a God who created all things. He is good, holy, and just. The way the scriptures talk about God is, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Everything has their source in God. We are created beings. God is an uncreated, eternal being. In 1 John 1, 5, it says that this is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. God is good, he is holy, and he is just. There is no shifting shadow about him. He is the, the, the powerful creator being. He is holy and he is righteous. That's who God is. And, and we, we are introduced to him. By contrast, the gospel message must move to our need. So we go to who are we? We're mankind made in his image, but we are have sinned. And we are because of that, we are separated from the holy God. We are sinful and therefore separated from God, and the just punishment for sin is death. Now, so back in, in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, God created the first human beings, Adam and Eve. He put them in this amazing place called the Garden of Eden. His intention toward them is good. His intention toward them is to have a relationship with them. And he gave them just one rule. Eat of any tree in the garden you want. Just don't eat from this one tree. Because if you eat from that tree, it will represent you've disobeyed. And that disobedience, that rebellion, sin will enter, and that will separate you from me. I want to be with you. I want to have a relationship with you. I love you. But that, if you get separated from me, it will result in your death. So he, he told them that up front. It was no bait and switch. Everything was great. He gave them the one rule, and we know the rest of the story, that Adam and Eve did not stay in that state of, of unbroken communion with God for very long. We don't know how long they were there. But sin entered the human race, and as a result, everyone born of Adam and Eve, which is everybody, all the human race, you and me, we are sinful and therefore separate of God, and our just punishment is death. The way the scriptures write about this is like Romans uh, 3, chapter 20, or chapter 3, verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 6 says, the wages of sin is death. So we have this great, amazing, holy, loving, good God, and we have mankind who is separated from his holiness because we have sin in us and we're destined to die. Now, if that were the only parts of the story, it, we couldn't call it the gospel. Gospel means good news, right? So we move forward in their presentation of the gospel and that God in love paid the just punishment for mankind's sin. In order for him to remain just, the punishment for sin had to be made either by us or he had to do it for us. And because God is love, he is merciful, his grace toward us is immeasurable, he himself paid for our sin by sending Jesus to be born take on flesh, to be born, born a human, human being, being, to live his entire life, life just like you and me, except for he was God, and he was without sin, and he went to the cross, shed his blood to pay that just penalty. This is, this is the heart of the good news of Jesus. Uh, this was told from long ago, long before Jesus was born on earth. Isaiah 53, 5 says it this way, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. God is putting the weight of sin on Jesus so that we, our wounds, could be healed. Second Corinthians says it this way, for our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him, Jesus, we might become the righteousness of God. God's very holiness, righteousness, goodness is credited to us. We didn't do anything to deserve it. God displayed his loving character, his good character, his just character, made sure that that punishment was paid in full through Jesus. And all we have to do is believe. Place our faith 
in Jesus Christ. So through faith in Jesus, we can be forgiven. That's how God's righteousness can be credited to us. That's how we can be forgiven as we, we believe that Jesus' death on the cross has paid in full the punishment that we ourselves were due. 1 John 1.9 says this, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And probably the most familiar passage in the Bible is John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. This is the proclamation of the gospel in, in the sense of his, his most essential nature of salvation. There's a holy God. We are separated from him from sin. God, who is loving, paid the penalty for our separation and our, uh, of death. And through faith in Jesus, now, we can be forgiven and have a relationship with God. That is such good news. Now, that's just one flavor of the gospel. That's the essential qualities of the gospel. The gospel is so much broader than this. Now we, that we have our faith in Jesus, we begin to experience life in a way with much greater meaning, relationship, connectedness that we've never had prior to the moment of salvation. So we have to work our way to the demonstration of the gospel, which is our experience once we place our faith in Jesus. And this really is the, the light showing all around the world just through our lives. We place our faith in Jesus, and now we are being transformed into his image. We are studying uh, Philippians at the 9 a.m. hour, and uh, Sierra has been doing such a great job. And I, I used Philippians in the last uh, several weeks as just my own personal uh, morning meditation and reading through and jotting things down. And uh, one of the verses that really stand out to me in, in Philippians as it relates to the gospel is chapter 1 and verse 27, which says this, Only let your manner of life be worthy of of the gospel. That opening statement, I love that. Let your manner of life, how you live, your life experience, what people see of you and in you, may it be worthy of the gospel. What does worthy mean? It's like a scale. And if you put the gospel on one side and it weights it down this way, it's like, well, how do I live my life so as to be worthy? We're living in a manner of way that's like that it, it reflective of the salvation that we've experienced, of God in us. Our life should reflect it in a way that reflects the, reflects the authentic nature of our faith in Jesus Christ. Let our lives, let anybody see us know Jesus. That Jesus is in us, and we're reflecting his character. It says, let your, your, your whole life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent and I hear of you, that you are standing firm in one spirit. Now, that speaks to the second half of our experience, is the community of faith we get to enjoy. Not only in my life is transformed, I get to be a part of this community of faith called the church that I feel unified with. It's my new family and I feel this inclusivity and love that I did not feel prior to this. You're standing firm in one spirit, one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. So when we talk about the, the demonstration of the gospel, we're talking about it on an individual sense and as well as a, a communal sense, how we are connected to one another, our individual experience and our collective experience. So let's talk about those two things. What does that look like for us? So start with what it feels like as an individual. Our individual experience, once we place our faith in Jesus Christ, now there's so much we can talk about. I'm just going to talk about three things. Love, meaning, and contentment. Of all of the things, what it means to live a life worthy of the gospel, we should experience this love from God specifically that we had never known before. So God, we we've, we've introduced him already as the holy, good, and righteous, and my sin separates me from him, and this lofty, creator, powerful God. But yet, when I place my faith in Jesus Christ, the sovereign, powerful, good, creator God now comes to dwell in me. The very intention in the Garden of Eden that he had with Adam and Eve 
to have communion with them, to enjoy time spent together in rich relationship is now restored through our faith in Jesus Christ. Now we experience the rich relationship with the creator God that we didn't before because we were separated because of sin. First and foremost, what should our experience be? Should be a rich, loving relationship with our creator. For me, I wake up every day recognizing this reality. I recognize who God is, and I open up the scriptures every morning. And God speaks to me through the Psalms or through the book of Philippians that I'm studying right now in such unique ways. And it's not that I'm studying, I'm, I'm thinking about those you know, people who, were, who actually wrote those words, whether it was King David in the Psalms or um, Paul and, and, and the church in Philippi you know, in the New Testament. Yes, I think in those terms, but I, I also realize that these very words are speaking to me. That God God himself is communicating to me. God who created me is with me. And I can talk to him just like I'm talking to you. And he hears me. I can pray to him knowing that he acts in prayer. I've been sick all week. And and you might hear my voice a little bit this morning. Uh, In fact, I lost my voice midweek. And uh, it it was just a whisper. And I'm thinking, okay. Lord, I need my voice to come back by Sunday. And uh, so I reached out to a few people and said, hey, can you just pray for me? I, I really need my voice to be here for Sunday morning. Uh, I'm feeling terrible and so on. I still don't feel good. So if I hold my distance from you, it's a gift to you. Okay, so I'm not going to shake hands after service today. I don't want to spread that kind of love uh, to you. But the reality is uh, I had to... Here's, here's the deal with, with a relationship with God. Now I have this God who controls all things that I can reach out to. Lord, I'm feeling weak. I'm feeling sick. I don't even have a voice. And you've called me to teach a message on Sunday morning. I need you to intervene on my, my behalf. I, I don't know if I can pull this off. And I called the family of God. People are close to me. Hey, I need some help. We have this great relationship with God that he can reach in and touch our lives. Now, I'm still sick. I don't feel good at all. But my voice is here. So God, maybe I should ask people to pray that I feel better too, right? So uh, if the voice is here, I'll take that. I ask for that prayer. And I believe that's answered. We have this God who's who's in us and controlling these things and, and is willing for our good. And so I'm very grateful that we have this great relationship of love with the Father. Our life also takes on meaning. So both the good and the bad, which formerly, when we looked at it, it's like we didn't understand. You know, we, we understand that sometimes good things happen to us as a result of our collective choices. We work hard, hard work, hard work pays off, and you know, we see we, we achieve goals and, and so on. Who gets the credit? It's easy for me to say, yeah, I've got, I get the credit. But life doesn't always work that way, right? Sometimes you can do all the work, do all the right things, but it doesn't really turn out the way you'd hope. Certain circumstances that are beyond your ability to control kind of intervene, and you experience loss and, and, and so on. In fact, the, we don't even start out uh, with those kinds of choices all the time. Uh, I started out with those kind of choices because I was born in the United States of America. I was born into a home that had uh, good parents that had a great work ethic. They knew the Lord. They taught me the Lord. I, that's the, I had no choice in that matter. I was born into this place. But what if I'm born into Karfapua, Haiti? I don't have the same choices that I have here. Uh, I'm hoping that I get a meal. So hard work does pay off, but it pays off a whole lot less in some parts of the world than others. We don't have control over all the things of our life. And it's important for us as believers, this is the, this is the message of the gospel that we experience, that even in those difficult times when life just is not working out the way we hope and for what feels like for good, we know that God, God is working all things for good according to his plan for those who love him or are called according to his purpose. That God is working out all things so that this world, as good as it is, as bad as it is, as hard as it is, is temporary. There is a world to come that God has promised. There is a life to come called eternal life. That we get to be in presence with God, that no matter what happens in this world, 
It is working toward a plan that brings God glory and, and other people to him, but ultimately is going to re- result in my reward. I am going to see God face to face one day in all the things that happened in my life that I had no choice in the matter that felt very harmful to me and were in fact can have a deeper meaning because it draws me to him and I can have hope because I know that this world ultimately is not my home. I'm passing through. I'll be with him forever. Again, the message of the gospel brings meaning to our life and in that brings contentment. Even if I don't have everything I need, I can be content knowing the reality of who God is. He loved me. He's already demonstrated his love for me in sending in Jesus, his son. I have this love relationship with God. He's watching out over all my steps. Even when I have a head cold, I can pray to him over that kind of thing. And he hears my prayer. Or if I don't know where my next meal is going to come from, God hears our prayer. Our life has meaning and therefore we can have contentment, whether in plenty or in times of want. Paul said in Philippians, that I found the secret of contentment. He said, it's in Jesus. Whether I'm hungry or well-fed, or I have everything I need, or I don't have anything I need, when I have Jesus, I am content. I see, I experience contentment. So the gospel is our salvation. We are forgiven of our sins, but the gospel is also our experience, a love relationship with God, meaning for all the good and bad that happens in our life, and a sense of contentment that he can give us, despite sometimes feeling hungry, sometimes feeling want, because our contentment is in Jesus Christ. So that's our individual experience, but we take that and we join it together with the body of Christ and we have a collective experience. And this is probably the most powerful manifestation of the gospel in the New Testament. Um, in, in our world, we think very much uh, in an individualistic mindset. Uh, I'm going to do make choices in my life that would make sense to me and how best benefits me, and, and I, I'm going to make decisions that affect me. And yes, it does affect other people, but pretty much I can make my way in the world. That's kind of how our mindset is. Not so in the first century, and particularly in the New Testament and Old Testament. It was all about the community. My survival depended on the, the thriving of the community, that I was a part of a community. Because I, if, if uh, there was an enemy that came and attacked me, wanted to steal my crops, steal my possessions, steal whatever that I was going to live on, I, I couldn't fend them off by myself. But I could if I had a community. If I have uh, trouble in my individual life, I could go to the community and find support. I could find um, resources so that I would not go hungry. The community was everything in the first century. And so when someone placed their faith in the gospel, oftentimes, because community was so important, not just to Christians, but to everybody in that world, you lost your sense of community. They said, well, you're serving a God that we don't serve. And you're out. You're out of our household. You're out of the community. All of a sudden, you're on your own. In a society that thrived on community, that was not a good thing. I didn't have a way of protecting myself. I didn't, want to, I didn't have a way to provide for myself. And the faith community, the church, Christianity, gathered together and created community in a way that was even stronger than blood ties of a household. Because even a son or a daughter could be cast out of a household because of their behavior not aligning with that household such as faith in Jesus. And this happens today in in societies where this is still true, like India, Pakistan. I've I've been to those places where Christians have been cast out of households and they're forced to fend for themselves outside of their household, their community. And the church serves such a vital place to say, you're invited in. Come with us. 
We'll make sure you have food. We'll make sure that you have what you need, that you feel supported. It's the whole reason why Wendy and, and us as a church would say, you know, we don't know the people in, in Haiti personally, but we know that they have faith in Jesus. And we feel a community with them. And so we have resources we want to send over to them to train their teachers, to give those children a hot meal, to be supportive of them because we feel like they're a part of us. They're a part of our community. And we want them to feel that way because they are receiving the care that we are expressing toward them. We do that in so many different ways. In us here at Grace Fellowship, you are part of this church, you can expect love and community. If you have not felt attached, if you felt kind of isolated, you're like, you know, I don't really ever fit in with any group, any social group growing up or in school, or I just I feel, you know, kind of an outcast. The church, in the church, you should never feel that way. The church should be the place where every single person, no matter who you are, should feel accepted. If we're functioning well, if we're functioning highly and healthily, and we understand that we ourselves have received such a gift from God of his love, we pour that same love out to one another. Are you feeling isolated? Are you feeling alone? Are you feeling like, you know, the world doesn't care about someone like me. God cares. We care. And we're striving hard to express that love and community in various ways so that you don't feel alone. A lot of the reasons that people come to Grace, our, our little church here, and, and they stay, you know, I think Jerry and Sue expressed this, and I've heard this so many times, is, you know, I, I feel uh, welcomed here. I feel like I'm a, I, I've got a family, uh, people that actually care about me. They ask about me when I'm not here. Now, that doesn't happen perfectly, right? But it's our intention that it should be the norm here at Grace. I love, uh, I was, I, we, we're uh, bringing in new members and so on uh, through our formal membership process uh, and one of the uh, people I was interviewing, uh, uh, they said, when I said, what was your first experience at a grace? When you first came through the doors, what was your experience? Well, I came through the door, and the first person who greeted me um, said, oh, are you new here? I said, yeah, I'm, I'm new. I've never been here before. He goes, well, the first time you're here, you're our guest. The second time, your family. I, I don't know specifically who that was. You, you, you know if that's you. Um, that is the quality of the community we're trying to communicate. Because that is the heart of God. If I place my faith in Jesus, I have forgiveness of sins. Yes, that's how I get in the door. But I gain an individual experience of I have the love relationship with God, meaning in my life, contentment, and I'm a part of this community to express love deeply with one another. One, element, one more element of the community I want to uh, communicate is is the importance of honesty to develop a high sense of community. What do I mean by that? What I mean is that we are honest about our flaws. One of the things that you'll find, and I'm hoping to continue to press this in, in ways that I hope are meaningful, we can't really be vulnerable with one another unless we know one another well. If we only see the Instagram version of ourselves, the curated version, I'm going I'm to show you all the, the, my favorite parts of me because I'm not going to let you see any of the hard things about my life. Um, we can only get so close. But if we oh, reveal the, the hard things, if we reveal the things that I feel maybe I have attached shame to, guilt, I'm struggling with, and we're honest with one another. The quality of this community is hey, that's okay. We're all flawed. We all struggle. And we're here to support you. And we're here to include you in this community. And so you'll hear me say, uh, I'm committed to this as a, a, a shepherd here at Grace, as a teacher, is you'll, you'll hear me sometimes say things that are, feel very vulnerable to you. It's important to me to share with you the things that are hard in my life. Um, things that uh, either I'm going through this hard or that maybe I'm not at, totally proud of in my life. It's important because you need to see for that from the top down uh, that all of us, we're just human beings trying to serve Jesus. 
I don't want to give you some picture that uh, I've got it all together because I do not. I need Jesus just like every single one. I need Jesus to work in and through the parts of my life that I, I struggle with. Pride, ego, fear, insecurity. I struggle with, you know, when I'm asking, I struggle with asking people to pray about my cold. First of all, because I feel like, you know, I don't want to trouble anybody about my own personal issues. This really isn't that big a deal. People have bigger problems in the world. Why would I ever reach out? I struggled with that, but I said, no, I'm going to text people because I want them to know I am needy. I don't like being needy to anybody. I want to stand on my own two feet, make my own decisions, make my way in the world. Uh, That doesn't help me be very close to other people. And so even in a simple thing, like asking for prayer, I needed to reach out and say, hey, I'm, I'm struggling. And those few were faithful to pray for me. Here's another little thing that's a little, that was easy to share, but here's something that's a little harder to share. When I ask for prayer, I don't always, I struggle sometimes with believing that God will answer that prayer. Like, yeah, if you put it out there for pray, prayer and then nothing happens and if Sunday happens, I, don't, I still don't have my voice. Man, what are you going to do about that, you know? Um, do you even believe that God's going to hear this kind of prayer? He's got far bigger issues to deal with in the world, you know? I, I had to work through that even in my own heart. Is God going to hear this kind of prayer? Is he going to do something on my behalf? I, in the end, walked through that in my own heart and said, yeah, of course he is. He loves me. He wants to know the deep, the very smallest things about our life. That's the kind of relationship he wants. But it requires us to be honest, to expose the flawed nature of our lives. And that's one thing you're, you're going to hear over and over from this stage. It hopefully is appropriate levels of honesty. And in smaller settings, where I'm one one that was a really trusted person, I hope to be far more honest than that. It's so vital to us understanding our needs and to, be, uh, to grow in our faith. So we have the proclamation of the gospel, the demonstration of the gospel through our individual life and our community life, and then we have the invitation of the gospel. We ourselves actually provide opportunities for other people to connect to Jesus. We've got the goods. We've got an awesome relationship with God. Like we want to tell the world about it. Right? And so I just want to give you some really practical ways to do that this morning as we kind of wrap up our service today. Number one, easy, easy stuff here. Invite someone to church. You know, this seems old school (laughs) because, uh, you know, we we put so much time in our our modern culture into having this online presence and this production oriented thing where we want to market the gospel, market not just the gospel, probably more so market grace fellowship to our community so people find us and so on. We kind of don't put our eggs in that basket as much. We try to stay up with the times and, and, and so on. We're, we struggle a little bit sometimes. Uh, but, but we find that when I interview people who are coming to grace, uh, the by far, there are some people who find us through the Internet and find us through our website. Uh, by far, though, people find us because they were invited by another person. They are invited by their neighbor, their coworker, uh, a friend. That's just how it works, Uh, and it's an easy thing, and it it includes all of us, right? You don't have to be a person on a street corner with a a sandwich board, uh, pray to Jesus. I'm grateful for those people. Uh, I'm not one of those people. My father-in-law is one of those people, right? He is, uh, if you know my father-in-law, Martha's dad, Marty Hooper, uh, he uh, he likes to travel on Christmas Day because he'll wear a bright red, complete suit, pants, jacket, everything bright red because he looks like Santa. He loves the attention that that brings and he uses that to share the gospel. He is an evangelist at heart. He goes all over the world sharing the gospel. There's not a stranger uh, that he doesn't talk to and then tell them about Jesus. You eat lunch with Marty Hooper, you better be prepared that he's going to call out the server and say, hey, how can I pray for you? And not just, yeah, but Oh, I'll pray for you. No, he's going to stop. He's going to grab their hands. He's going to look them in the eyes, and he's going to pray for them right there on the spot. Uh, Us more introverted type of people are dying on the inside when he's doing this kind of stuff. 
uh, all right? And so, yes, God bless you extroverts and your ability just to tell everyone and everywhere. My, I married an extrovert, and Martha's even done this to me. And, you know, she does, what she does to me is like, oh, we need to pray for you. Mark, will you pray for them right now? I'm like, oh, Lord Jesus. <laughs> Here we go, you know? Type of people never meet it, the stranger. We're standing in line and she's cut, you know. I, she has this intimate conversation. Intimate is probably another word, but it felt that way to me. We were in, uh, we were, uh, before a glass case of yogurt and there was an uh, older gentleman who, who's kind of contemplating the yogurt and she strikes up this yogurt conversation. It's like, how do you strike up yogurt conversations? And it's like this intimate where they just like shared this love for Chobani yogurt that they just shared this moment. You know, it's like, there's nothing like Chobani. Yes, I know. You know, and there was like, it's like, how do you even do that? You know, me, I'm just like, when someone talks to me in the line, I'm like, why is this person talking to me right now? You know, not that I'm unfriendly, it's just that I'm introverted, right? Do anybody relate to that at all? Yes. So God uses all of us, both of our, the extroverts, our extroverts that just want to put it all out there and, and just what energizes them, and all of those of us who like a little more private way of, of trying to connect with people and so on, um, he uses all of us in our various ways that we connect with people, and we must all, though, choose to extend the invitation. How? Hey, you, you go to church or anywhere in the area? Do you, why don't you come to Grace? I go to a great church. Come, and you're going to experience great people. You're going to hear a good message. It's as simple as that. And we made it even easier. On our tables out in the lobby, uh, you'll see little business card holders, and in them are these little business cards. You might have noticed them out there. They're free for the taking. They're not a business card, so you know how to contact the church. They're a business card. They're actually an invitation. It says, join us on the back. And on the front, it just says, Sundays at 1030, and it has our own address and our phone number. Uh, that's it. So if you have one of these in your purse or your wallet and you, you wanna, you're want you in a conversation, you can say, here, here we are. This is how you find us. This is the, the time of our service and so on. I'm going to cough unless I take a drink. <laughs> Had to mute. All right. So yeah, take one of those invitations, take a bunch of them, wherever you are, inviting people. Number one way people find the church. Get to know your neighbors. People live all around you. <coughs> now, I'm, I'm a townie. I live, I live in Jackson. Some of you live on very remote parts of the world, um, like Shake. So someone just pray <clears throat> that that cough goes away because it's right there at the back of my throat. <clears> throat> and so sometimes uh, getting to know your neighbor, it takes a little more of a challenge if you live in a remote parts of our county. If you walk down somebody's neighbor road, you might be looking at the other end of a, a rifle. Um, <laughs> so you have to be, you know, understand where you live. But get to know people around you. Get to know people in your community. It's not just the people who live next to you, but your neighbor the people that you uh, rub shoulders with on a consistent basis in your neighborhood, in, in uh, your, your walk of life. Uh, and that's the person, as, you, as your life overlaps, likely God will use in some way to share the gospel in some way. Now, the gospel, as we talked about this morning, it can be a sliver of the gospel that you share with somebody. Perhaps, Perhaps your, your own honesty with, with your, your own flawed, flawed nature. nature. Oftentimes, the biggest um, in, uh, inhibitor for people to, to be introduced to Jesus is, is our Christians themselves. Because <clears throat> they perceive us as hypocrites. I think honesty is the cure for this. If we're just honest. I'm a flawed person. I need Jesus. I, I, I just want you to know that we all need Jesus. Come, to, come with me. I'll show you where, how you can find him. And it's as simple as that. The more honest we are, the more endearing the message of Jesus is because God is endearing. Get involved with the service club. <clears throat> At, in, all of these avenues, you'll find a common denominator. You just have to be around people. You have to connect with other people. And some of us need different ways to do that. If you're like me, you're more introverted. I need a, uh, something you're doing mutually together. So, so joining something like Rotary Club or, or Lions Club or some other service uh, club uh, 
uh, is a great way to invest in our community as well as get to know people that you wouldn't normally meet. Another idea is to join or create a hobby group. Um, I was, uh, Jeremy had mentioned, we were uh, at a, a memorial service for Debbie Schnabel uh, on Friday. And Debbie was a longtime member of Grace Fellowship, um, and she, her life, um, she, she passed recently as a result of dementia, early onset dementia. And um, she was one who expressed her faith through art, and specifically art as uh, in quilting. And she was a part of different quilt groups, she, uh, organizations that was nationwide, uh, and she had r remote uh, uh, in relationships with people online. She did uh, seminars, and she went and joined clubs and so on, that all about something that she really enjoyed, which was quilting. And if you see any of, of Debbie's quilts, you know that all of them, uh, many of them were just beautiful displays of, of who God was, or various passages of scripture, and, and so on. And that was one of the great ways that God used a, just an interest, a hobby of hers that she loved to display who God was in those groups. All kinds of ways that we can share and invite people to know who Jesus is. Coach your, neighbor, uh, coach your, your child's sport. I did this a lot with our girls. Um, I coached volleyball for 20 years and I uh, coached track and field. Uh, before and, and so on, and a lot of lots of kids I've involved, not just with the kids through that, but I get to meet their families, um, which is which is great. Those of you who are coaches, I I just want to affirm that if you invest your time in tennis or soccer or football or baseball or you know volleyball as I did or whatever sport that you can invest your time in, there's just ways of getting to know other people and extending the love of Jesus, and then just practically serving the people around you. When you see a need, meet a need. Whether that's someone driving down the road that's broke down, uh, someone who's trying to lift something heavy in a, in a parking lot, um, you don't even know them, but you run to help them in whatever capacity. It is a way of displaying the love of Jesus that you can connect with God if we are intentional. And so I'm going to invite the, the worship team to come on up, and we're going to use this song we, that we uh, sang last week as a, an invitation, if you will, um, for us to, okay, God, how are you going to use me? You have come to dwell in me, so I have my own individual experience of this love relationship that I'm growing in. I'm a part of this great faith community that I'm also um, intentionally investing in so I can understand the, the fullness of that relationship. Lord, uh, I want to take that step of inviting other people to join with me in this great experience of knowing Jesus and have meaning and contentment and community. But it takes some courage and some intention. And so the purpose of this, our closing song, is to reflect that in a sense of, we're going to sing it as a prayer. So would you stand together as we pray this last song with the worship team? Narrow as the road may seem, I follow where your spirit leads. Broken as my life may be, I will give you every piece of I hear.
as we close our time with a word of prayer. Father, we do give our hearts to you today. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for forgiving us, cleansing our hearts so we can have a relationship with you. Now, God, thank you. You've given us this community to enjoy with one another. Help us to be courageous, God, in our love for one another. Help us to be courageous in our honesty. Help us to be courageous in sharing who you are to the world around us, no matter where that takes us and how that looks. God, we humble ourselves. We swallow our own pride, admit our flawed nature, and point the way to you. God, help us in Jesus' name. Amen. Grace and peace to you today.